to make my own way in the world. No one makes their own way. Least of all a woman. You'll need to marry well. But you are not married, aren't you? Well, that's because I'm rich. And just to blink, your life's changed forever. You know, it's very peculiar doing things you'd never imagined. Hudson, uh, la mano, si. Hello, and thanks for joining us for Encore's weekly film show with our critic, Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Eve. Now, we're starting with a film adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's 1868 classic novel, Little Women, directed by actress-turned-director Greta Gerwig. Tell us more. Well, it may have little in the title, but as one French newspaper put it, Alcott was the J.K. Rowling of her era. Now, there have been countless previous film versions of the book known in French as The Four Daughters of Dr. March, at least two of them silent, followed by George Cukor's 1933 film with Catherine Hepburn, Mervyn Leroy's 1949 version with Elizabeth Taylor, and then female directors stepped in, Gillian Armstrong in 1994 with Winona Ryder and Susan Sarandon, and now Gerwig. There are Japanese Japanese animated versions, plays, operas and ballets, and don't forget TV. And here in France, Simone de Beauvoir was a big admirer of the book. Now, the frugal March family uh, was very popular in the version that hit theaters during the Great Depression. And here, Gerwig has managed to give contemporary resonances to the very different but slyly assertive women of a poor but very supportive American family. Okay, Lisa, let's take a look at Little Women. I'm working on a novel. It is a story of my life and my sister's. Make it short and spicy. And if the main character is a girl, make sure she's married by the end. Ow, Every Joe! I want to be an artist in Rome and be the best painter in the world. That's what you want too, isn't it, Joe? To be a famous writer? Yes, but it sounds so crass when she says it. My girls have a way of getting into mischief. Well, so do I. This is Meg, Amy, Beth, and Joe. I intend to make my own way in the world. No one makes their own way. Least of all a woman. You'll need to marry well. But you are not married, aren't you? Well, that's because I'm rich. <laughs> well, set in the 1800s, the March sisters grew up in a very different time, living through things like the American Civil War. Well, yes, life was still fairly hard and rustic for most people, although it doesn't really look like it there. And if you caught a serious illness, say scarlet fever, you probably weren't going to recover. Dr. March, who is a doctor of divinity, not a medical doctor, has gone off to minister to the spiritual needs of the soldiers of the Union Army, leaving his wife and four girls to entertain themselves, be endlessly charitable to their neighbors, and somehow keep food on the table. Well, the reviews have been glowing. What did you think? <sighs> glowing is right. I like it just fine, but not apparently as much as I'm being told I should. Anthony Lane in The New Yorker wrote, quote, right now, though we can't foretell whether time will be cruel or kind to Gerwig's Little Women, it may just be the best film yet made by an American woman, end quote. I certainly hope that's not true. This is a smart, well-crafted movie, but I hope American women can do better. Uh, plenty of European women already have. Off the top of my head, I'd say 2018's Can You Ever Forgive Me by Mariel Heller is a strong candidate, as are many of the films made by Catherine Bigelow. After a while, this is just me, I tend to find tight-knit families slightly suffocating. And boy, is the March family close. If a sister of mine had burned my novel in progress that I had written painstakingly by dipping a pen into ink, I would not have forgiven her in this lifetime. So, Joe March, a fictional character, but a vivid one, is a better person than I am. Okay, it's hard enough to cut down your scripts, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, now to a film that sees two veteran British actors on screen together for the first time. Tell us about Ian McKellen and Helen Mirren in The Good Liar. Gladly. Some people like to go to the movies to see hot, new, young, up-and-coming talents. I enjoy that too. But I really like to see veteran oldsters, whether they're being subtle or chewing the scenery. And this is a combination of both. Mirren and McKellen are always fun to watch, whatever the material. And this material, it must be said, is wobbly. This film is set in London in 2009, and there's a reason for that. For one thing, our two protagonists, both widowed and having met via an online dating service, can go on a date to see Inglorious Bastards at the cinema and have a conversation about making adjustments to history and what people will or will not fall for. It's a nice bit of foreshadowing. <laughs> 
OK, well, let's take a look at two distinguished thespians stretching their stuff. How much do you think she's worth? Nearly three million pounds. You're going to take the lot? You bloody bet I'm going to take it all. Is that your grandson? It's too soon to be getting so close to him. I've grown very fond of you. Do you know who you are? You're the only person on this planet who makes me feel that I'm not alone. I know things about you, who you really are. You don't want to do this, Roy. It's the game. It's the adrenaline rush. What if it is? Now, Bill Condon has already directed Ian McKellen in Gods and Monsters, which the director won an Oscar for, and in Mr. Holmes. Tell us more about him. Well, he's a screenwriter who also directs, and for me, he's incredibly uneven. His good movies are wonderful. Gods and Monsters, which you mentioned, Kinsey, Mr. Holmes, and he's also the man behind the screen version of Chicago, Dreamgirls, and the first two Twilight movies. Now, from the opening credits here, there may be as well be this giant billboard saying, hmm, things are not quite what they seem, but that's okay. Anybody who has ever seen a movie will pick up on the fact that something's not quite right, uh, but it would be hard to guess the motivations of certain characters unless you've read the book or been on the set while they were making it. Okay. All right, then. Let's move on. Out this week in France is Tommaso by American independent director Abel Ferrara. It stars Willem Dafoe, with whom Ferrara has a very special relationship with, doesn't he? Indeed he does. This is the fifth film Ferrara and Dafoe have made together. Uh, and because we're in France, an enterprising distributor assumed filmgoers would like to be able to see all five collaborations on the big screen, the American actress Sylvia Sidney, who acted for over 70 of her 88 years, including with Tim Burton, was asked what the secret is of having a long career, and she answered, don't die. <laughs> Ferrara, who lives in Rome, has been sober for years now, but like a lot of renegade artists, he definitely could have died several times over. So he overcame addiction and keeps making movies. And Tommaso, which co-stars Ferrara's real wife and daughter, as recovering drug addict Tommaso's wife and daughter, Duffo is sometimes mellow, sometimes erratic, but almost always interesting to watch. OK, well, let's see whether that's true. You're so busy, you forget I'm a woman. Stai zitto! You know, I'm haunted a little bit by the fact that I get the paranoid thoughts. You don't even help me with that Stop shit! It. You're a big problem! I need you! I need you! God! Shut It's your body time! Now, the 12-step meetings among uh, English speakers in Rome are full of harrowing stories. The private lessons Tommaso gives play with boundaries. Defoe shows off his ability to hold yoga poses, as you saw, and we get a vivid tour of what jealous paranoia feels like from the inside. Now, in 2014, the two men made really good use of the startling resemblance Defoe has to the Italian author and filmmaker Pierpaolo Pasolini to follow him on the last day of his life in 1975. It's uneven, but still impressive. 444, Last Day on Earth, is set in New York on the day the world is really, genuinely going to come to an end. And if you know this is it, and you've worked very hard to keep sober, do you go ahead and score drugs on that very last day because it can't possibly matter now, or do you stick to your hard-won sobriety? New Rose Hotel and Go Go Tales don't do much for me, but I really like a Ferrara movie without Defoe, but with Gerard Depardieu as a behavioral dead ringer for Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Uh, 2014's Welcome to New York is sordid and uneven, but also instructive and way out there. Okay, it sounds fabulous. And the documentary Cunningham tells us about the accomplishments of a true artistic pioneer who kept expressing himself through movement until his death at 90 after a 70-year career. This is a fabulous documentary, isn't it? This terrific documentary depicts the last dancers to have worked directly with Cunningham, dancing some of his choreographies created between 1942 and 1972. See it in 3D if you possibly can. Now, our supposed thirst for 3D launched a decade ago by the planetary success of Avatar has pretty much petered out. But when it comes to dance, as Vim, Vim Vendors proved uh, with his astonishing tribute to choreographer Pina Bausch in Pina, 3D can make us feel like we 
are part of the action. Cunningham is pure dance, which in his case means pure innovation. Now, composer John Cage and dancer Merce Cunningham, I have to say some people have names that are just ready-made to be artists, doesn't it seem, began living and working together in the early 1940s. In archive recordings, Cunningham is heard telling interviewers that he would never call himself an avant-garde choreographer, even a modern dance choreographer. He identifies himself as a dancer. And he says that, I'm paraphrasing, you have to have a screw loose <laughs> if you want to be a dancer in the first place because it takes constant effort for what people who are not dancers would assume is absolutely minimal reward. He's adamant that his dances don't mean anything and that you're welcome to go looking for subtext if you like, but what he is presenting is the essence of movement. Okay, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us this week. We're going to leave you with Cunningham. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Any movement is possible for dancing. We were different from one another and he saw those differences. I think the real thing is the fact that you continue, that you keep on making something.